We would like to acknowledge that the episodes in this series are produced on the traditional unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We thank them for allowing us to be their guests. I actually, I actually remember the first show I ever saw. Um, I was in kindergarten, and um, Young People's Theatre brought a play called Dandelion to Smith Falls, and they performed it. I remember this so clearly. Um, they performed it on the set of the local amateur theatre production, which was like a living room set, and they put their little set up in front of it. And um, Years later, when I was out of theater school, I did a summer doing the archives for YPT, and I found the show, The Dandelion. Wow. Um, and I, I don't know why. It's, I re like, I remember nothing. My sister has the memory in the family, but I remember that show. And I think it just impacted me. And then... How old were you? Uh, kindergarten. Kindergarten. So like five, yeah. six. Yeah. But it really, I just, uh, it, it, I connected with it. Yeah, that's great. And then it, I remember in elementary school, a touring company brought Tom Longbow, a show about Tom Longbow to our elementary school, and they did it on the floor in the gym. And so more than anything that I remember about school, I remember those experiences. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in high school, we were in London, Ontario, I saved my babysitting money and I bought a student subscription to Theatre London, it was called then. Right. And I loved it. I remember sitting in the balcony at a production of The Collected Works of Billy the Kid. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. Wayne Burnett was Billy the Kid. And because um, the cheap seats were up in the gods. And um, he did this speech. There's a speech, a monologue about being fucked by the sun. And it's really. Yeah. And I watched entire rows of the orchestra get up and walk out of the theater. Wow. And. London um, was always a little bit it conservative. Was not their know, cup it, of tea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that was a pretty inflammatory play when it, in the in, in the day. day. Yeah, in yeah. the day, because yeah. that would have been what in the seventies. Yeah, seventy three, maybe something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just it was an art form that spoke to me. I, I, I hate to say it. I, I don't get opera. I just don't connect with it. Um, I like the symphony. I like dance, but I love the theater. Yeah. So this was right from the get-go. Yeah. Wow. I don't know why. So what? So okay. So you really loved it. Did you participate in it? Like in school? Yeah. In Did high you, school, yeah, yeah. Um, my best friend auditioned for um, a Nook in the Sun at the local community theater company, right. and yeah. they were also looking for people to make props. Uh huh. So um, I signed up to make props, and. That was it. I worked there all through high school as a volunteer at the community theater, and yeah. um, and then I got summer jobs in summer th community theater. And uh, but somehow I don't know how I found out that some people actually did it for a living. And I was still in high school, so um, I thought that's what I'm going to do. I wanted to be a stage manager. And I knew in high school what I wanted so to do. So you didn't want to act. No, You didn't never. want to sing. You didn't want to do any of that. You're not a, you're not a look at me, look at me type person. No. Right, right now I feel like I'm in the Spanish Inquisition. No, um, come on. But, but, um, Spanish Inquisition <laughs> would be more fun. <laughs> um, so uh, I applied to, and I thought I was going to get pushed back from my parents because they were very university oriented. Right. But I got accepted to York University and that was okay because I was sure. going to go to university. But then I also got accepted to the National Theatre School. Ah. So then my dad could boast about his daughter at the National Theatre School. So even though it wasn't a university, I was allowed to go. Right. And That's I was true. young. I was, yeah. went right out of high school. So they had a tech. They had a National Theatre School uh, in, in the day, had a, had a performing group. And, and they had, had a production had a, had department. A production but I, um, they didn't take 
kids right out of high school. Uh -huh. So they didn't accept me into the production department. They accepted me into the first year of what was called preparatory year. Okay. So there were um, three English kids and um, 16 French students. And uh, we did, it was basically a design year. Uh -huh. I, I learned to paint 60 shades of gray. <laughs> Which I'm, I could probably still do. It's a talent, yeah, yeah. right? That not I in a good that. way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so I did that, and then I got—I was the only one reaccepted into the English production, and I did two years of that. Yeah. Um, and so then I just started working. And okay, so you started working. Where did where did you go first? Um, what was your first I, job, I, paying job? I was hired by um, Colleen Blake, who was the production manager at Young People's Theatre and who I adored and who I really, she was an inspiration to me. And um, she, uh, we're still in touch on Facebook. Um, That's uh, great. That's and great. Um, she, uh, so she hired me and then um, I was an apprentice stage manager and then I got my card there uh -huh. um, on a John Lazarus school tour of schoolyard games okay, to in Northern Ontario. I got my driver's license to be the driver. If you can imagine <laughs> that I was sent out on tour with a driver's license I'd had for like two weeks. With a whole bunch of actors, yeah. Oh my God, anyway. You got a whole van full of actors. How many actors were um, there? That show had three actresses, schoolyard games. Okay. And three women and me. Uh -huh. um, and. Uh, I've got to say that's it was, actually okay. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Uh, well, it yeah. was dire. It was dire. Yeah. We just we would do our shows. We'd be back in the hotel by four o'clock. Eight is enough was on at four o'clock, <laughs> and one day eight is enough wasn't on, and I burst into tears. Like it was not. It, it, I would not call that tour one of my highlights. Oh my god! The women were all really nice. We spent a lot of time knitting, um, <laughs> but it was not right. a party tour. Yeah. Yeah. I have been on party tours. Yes, right. <laughs> They're more fun. Okay, so how long was that? How long of a tour was it? I don't remember. Um, like a month? Did you go out and in and out in? Or uh, did we you did, go like all around? Uh, we went all around yeah. uh, northern Ontario. So we would have been on the road, I'm going to guess, a couple of months. Wow. Maybe wow, we went back yeah. a bit. Okay. But the next show I did... Saved um, your money, though. Oh, yes, we yeah, did. Because yeah. what else were we going to do? Um, the next show I did was Richard Greenblatt's Twelfth Night which had eight actors, two vehicles, Dick Binsley, who else, Bill Colgate, like, oh my God. Um, uh, we're actually all still in touch. That's um, great. A few years ago, they called me and they said, we're having dinner next weekend, and I flew to Toronto for dinner with them. That's sweet. That's and great. Um, I've seen them again, and it was really fantastic. It was a fantastic experience, and we did not save any money. No. <laughs> Um, and we actually toured that, we took that show at twice and we also did it at YPT. So um, uh, we were a company that loved each other. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's really, really and good. And drank our body weight in alcohol. So how long, so, so you're basically with y, YPT now. I, yeah, for, I was there for, I can't remember, three or four years maybe. Uh -huh. And then, and then what happened? And then I uh, start. I, I worked everywhere. I. Um, I don't know. I worked at MTC. Stage I worked managing. At, yeah, and everything, Prairie all, Theater across exchange. the country. Or um, I did a national tour. Um, uh, that's why I ended up moving out here because uh -huh. um, we were doing this national tour and we did a stop in Calgary up to our wazoo's in snow. It was awful. Oh, I know. It was called. It was she stoops to conquer. Right. We called it she bends for friends, and um, we had thirteen opening nights and twelve terrible reviews, but they loved us in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, <laughs> and we came out here from Calgary and people met us at the airport with armloads of daffodils. People were in shorts. Um, we, we dumped our stuff and walked around Stanley Park and I thought, I am moving here. And then about three years later, Larry Lillo asked me to come out and stage manage for him at the Playhouse and I went, ah, uh, okay. Now, how did you know him? Because um, I'd been hired to stage manage at the Grand, which is where we, all three of us met. Yes. Um, yeah. Born Yesterday Born with yesterday. you, Stevie, yeah. and that amazing production of Top Girls, Susie, with you. Yeah. Um, 
fantastic show. Yeah. And that's where I met Bill Millard came to see a show there. Um, that's when I met Bill Millard, and he had gaffer's tape holding one of his shoes together. <laughs> and I'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> um, but I'm sure it was cheaper than new shoes. Because um, Marsha Sibthorpe was doing some they lighting. They were probably props, from, <laughs> prop shoes that he just, you know, figured he'd use again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, we love you, Bill. Uh, he, Bill is someone I really come to love, like, pre-pandemic. Um, he and Norman and Armour and I would have uh, a, um, I was going to say a drunken lunch, but that's not appropriate. We would have a leisurely lunch um, uh, about once a month. That's nice. Um, so I really miss that. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, yeah. we see nobody now. Wait a minute, Larry died in 93, so yeah. it was in the late 80s that I came out. Yeah, yeah. So after Expo, so late mm -hmm. 80s. Um, and we're talking about Larry Lillo. Yes. And this is going out to the whole world. Yes. So... We're talking about Larry Lillo, who was pretty much, I guess, maybe the best director to ever hit this town, I, I think. You know, we worked with him right from school. We were in school with Larry. Really good friends. Um, you know, did Tamanus together for years and years and, you know, sort of just followed him around anytime he, you know, condescended to hire us, you know, after, after he, you know, went became he became like really really big people yeah. across the country were talking about him yeah but uh, Tom Cohn said something once about Larry said they should build a new theater in town they should name it the Lillo and I agree with that I've all yeah. I, I totally agree yeah. with that he was a fantastic guy to know and to work with he uh, yeah. I am um, I stage managed for him for seven years mm -hmm. um, and shortly before he died of AIDS um, he stopped directing, and I left stage management because um, yeah. there wasn't anybody else that I wanted to stage manage for. Yeah. Because um, it was always interesting and fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Even when it was a failure, you yes. know, which didn't happen very often. But even when it was one of these things that you didn't know whether it was going to, you know, just kind of off balance, yeah. you know, it was still one of the best things that you'd ever see that year. Um, I came in with Larry, and um, that was an artistic high point. Mm -hmm. And, um, but even under Larry, who was, I remember when Larry died, somebody, um, Stratford sent a note to the memorial, and they referred to him as a golden boy, and that's how I still think of him, the golden boy. Um, but. He was there five years, effectively, and he had three deficits, which yeah. um, was actually a better record than anybody <laughs> had in a long time. Yeah. But um, because the company was lumbered with a civic facility, mm -hmm. lumbered with 50-year-old uh, uh, IATSE agreement, which was really high wages, mm -hmm. um, the company believed that um, its mandate was excellence which is fantastic. But when I work with companies today as a consultant, if somebody says to me, um, we want our work to be excellent, I don't even allow them to use the word, everybody's work should be excellent. Sure. So that shouldn't be your focus. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the Playhouse had sort of lost its way because there was now competition when the Playhouse started, mm -hmm. when the regional, Canada set up a series of regional theaters. The Playhouse was one of them. There was no other company here mm -hmm. really of any substance yes um but the arts club grew up and focused on marketing mm -hmm. where the playhouse focused on excellence and marketing won yeah marketing won yeah um so kudos to bill millard because yeah. he really was able to build that but the playhouse kept changing leadership and um and was burdened by physical facilities that it couldn't afford yeah. And so it really needed a, a significant rethink. Um, what was the Playhouse? What should the Playhouse have been in a market where there were now two large scale companies and it couldn't support both of them? Mm -hmm. But it never really got that rethink. And I think if Larry had lived, um, he would have begun to look differently at how that company operated. We often talked about it. In the t at the time, 
about, you know, how could you change this? Because one of the things that we really like, when we were working at the cultural center a lot of the time, was we, we really, and we were a resident company there with Tamanus, the idea that kind of people could kind of come in and go out, and the, and the theater itself became sort of a, a people place, sort of 24-7, you know, in, yeah. a, in a way, yeah. or at least during every working day, you know, it was a fluid kind of thing. Well, the Playhouse, because it was this civic theater with this big union house, you know, you needed permission to open just about any door. You know, it was very, very difficult. And if you wanted to do something, um, uh, if you wanted to sell anything, if you wanted to, do, and I think this is probably still the case, if you wanted to sell, say, a book, say you wrote a book about the history of the Playhouse, and you want to have a little table there, you needed you needed permission to do that. That was that was kind of like, oh my God, what are they going to do? They're going to sell some stuff in the Playhouse. You permission, know, and you had yeah. to pay a commission. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, you know, that's how a civic theater operates, mm -hmm. but it's not... It doesn't have to. Well, it's not helpful for an arts yeah. organization no. to be in no. something that structured. No. Um, you know, as if the revenue from selling the book about the history of the Playhouse is going to help the budget of the city. You know, I mean, come on. No, really, I know. Seriously. You know, um, let's smoke some more dope. I know. You know. It was nuts. Yeah. They used to charge Theater Cares a commission on t-shirt sales. Um, which was ludicrous. Theatre Cares was um, set up to raise funds for AIDS, not to support the civic theatres in their fundraising endeavours as a civic building. Um, but, and I will say, there are a lot of people who disagree with me about the Playhouse. They believe that the Playhouse um, could have been sustained. They believe that um, it should have had a further life there. They blame um, people or institutions in the city for the Playhouse folding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that this is my opinion, mm -hmm. and I really was in those trenches. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to have a, 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 a vibrant playhouse again. I really would like it. I thought it was wonderful when it was working well. I thought it's, it, it was like uh, the center of the atom. You know, all the yeah. other stuff revolved around it. And when the playhouse got sick, everything else got sick. And And... You know, and I really do wish there had been more will uh, at the time to to fix it. You know, um, but hey, you know, it's not the the world we live in here. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it was it, for me. It was a huge loss. Um, a few years later, I happened to be at a a meeting in the building, and. Um, so I just walked out of the meeting and through the Playhouse lobby and I walked into the theater and it was dark. Mm -hmm. And I just sat in the back row and I just sat there and I used, that's the row I used to sit in, that's the row Larry used to sit in when he watched a mm -hmm. show and it was just so beautiful to be back in that dark space. I love that venue. Yeah. And um, to think about the times yeah. we had. Yeah. administration. Um, uh, it was actually Larry who said to me, um, he said, you know, there's a, a job open as the assistant to the artistic director and general manager at the Playhouse. He was, he was no longer artistic director. He was too sick. And he said, why don't you take that job? Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't going to continue stage managing because I didn't want to work with anybody else. And so I did take that job. Um, for better for ill, and and I started my career in arts management, which has right. been, um, you know, I've had a very did, good career. Did you come to like that a lot, or has it just it. been just one problem after another? Yes, <laughs> yes, and yes. Um, and now I I teach arts management, and I love it, and I'm very passionate about it as a career choice. Yeah. Um, I uh, I highly encourage people. It's um, you're going to make a much better living than being an actor, generally speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just about anybody. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, no, I, I, I love arts management. So it was a very good fit for me and my skill set. Mm -hmm. so, oh, so where do you teach? 
Uh, I teach at Capilano University in the Arts and Entertainment Management Program. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a good fit. I, uh, you know, some of the students, it's so exciting to teach them. Yeah. Not all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but, and I, I've run into a lot of grads who are out working in, I've worked with some of the grads that I've taught. That and um, I've hired some of the grads that I've taught. And so... It's fun to be part of that next stage. Yes, yes, sure, for sure. Because um, yeah, yeah. they'll be the people taking the work forward. Tell me about Urban Inc. I want to talk about that too and, and how that uh, came into your life or what, what brought you there. And so, were you there when that began? Um, no. Yeah. So Urban Inc. was founded by Marie Clements, mm -hmm. oh, 20 years ago, maybe 21 years ago. Marie Clement started it, and she started doing these humongous shows, like with this little tiny company. She was doing shows that toured Canada, toured to Ottawa. Now, this was going to be an, in, an indigenous it, theater yeah, company. It was, yeah, it uh, was. She yeah. she founded it as indigenous and culturally diverse. Right. So that was her mandate. Okay. And then um, Diane Roberts came in, who's a black artist, and um, it took on more of her focus. And then Corey Payette came in as artistic director. Um, who's an Indigenous artist, and he um, sort of moved um, back to a focus on Indigenous and culturally diverse work. And, um, Corey, and this was, idea was going to be new plays a lot, all the time, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much. Um, when I was there with Corey, I was there for four years, I think, four years, um, uh, we did remount a production of Margot Kane's um, which hadn't been done in 20 years, um, called Moon Lodge, which was yeah, just yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. But um, generally speaking, it was new work and also community work. Mm -hmm. But the big piece that we did when I was there was a play that um, Corey had written, really his first piece, called Children of God. And um, it, it was sort of, uh, I, I, at the, it's an oxymoron to say that it's a musical about residential schools, but that's exactly what it is. Mm. It's a musical about residential schools, and it's an unbelievably powerful piece. Mm -hmm. And um, so we toured that all over the place, and I really, really hope that it continues to have a post-pandemic life um, because it's so unbelievably impactful. And um, what it did was it helped people, non-Indigenous people, actually understand the impact of residential schools. Right. And um, every performance was followed by a conversation, and it was so powerful, right. um, the conversations, because almost inevitably, at least one residential school survivor would speak, about his experience. Um, and then you would have non-Indigenous people um, talking about what it meant to them to develop an understanding of what had happened here. Yes. Um, yes. So it was an incredibly powerful piece to work on. I was so proud of being involved with it. It yeah, really... For sure. It was, it's, yeah, very powerful yeah. experience. Yeah. And... Um, uh, I'm obviously not Indigenous, and I felt somewhat conflicted about um, being in a leadership role in that company. So I didn't apply for the job. I had um, worked with Corey before uh, on a show of Marie Clements, The Road Forward. Um, so I knew Corey, and then I saw the posting for the job, and I thought, oh, that would be an interesting job, but I'm not Indigenous. Mm -hmm. and probably I can't afford to work there. <laughs> it was a small company. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I saw the posting again. They posted it again because they didn't fill it. And then I got a phone call from Corey who said, would you like to have coffee? And I said, I don't drink coffee. That's how these things start. <laughs> they always start with a cup of coffee. <laughs> I know. And then you get sucked right in. in. Yeah, right. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm not Indigenous, but I'm a member of an Indigenous family. Okay. And so... Yeah. Um, the work was very close to what was going on in my life. Right. And um, so uh, I joined Urban Inc. 
and um, it was a powerful four years. I, yeah, I, I bet. Yeah. Um, we did another show that, um, so Renai Morrison, Morriso is a, another artist I worked with there, and I would walk over broken glass to work with Renai again. Mm. She was such an incredible artist. But we did this show called SRO with a group of Indigenous women from the downtown east side with lived experience of homelessness. And so you, like my background is very Eurocentric, sure. large scale, sure. um, professional Proscenium theater. Proscenium arch. Exactly. Yeah. That's where I come yeah. from. Yeah. And um, you can take the girl out of the Proscenium arch, but, but yeah. it's always in her head. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, so this piece was about process. And so it was about seven months of development and then four performances. Wow. And the performances were great, but the point was the process. Mm -hmm. And that was another project that I loved being involved in. Yeah. Um, but I did, I retired from Urban Inc. four months into the pandemic. I had, it was a long plan. I'd given the board a year and a half notice. Um, uh, but because I have taken in my two nieces who are young children, um, uh, I found working full time and trying to raise two small children at my age was more than I was oh, come um, on. <laughs> capable of doing. You're a superwoman. You can do it. <gasps> I thought I was. Um, but um, put on your cape. Put on my <laughs> cape. My cape's worn out. Um, so I left my job at Urban Inc. And, um, uh, but it was a really great experience. I and bet. I'm really yeah. interested to see where the company goes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I took in these two kids and I never had children and it was hell. And um, uh, Christine Moynihan, who was in the Twelfth Night Tour with me, had had three kids and she said, OK, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to phone you every week and we're going to talk. And last year we did that every I think it was every Tuesday. Yeah. Um, Chrissy would and I would Zoom and she would just encourage me that this was in fact possible um, and give me some tools and um, but that's because we did a show together 40 years ago right um, right so I, right. I I don't know it's just um, I think we have so many opportunities um, with the connections that we make yeah yeah you never know where your life is gonna go no and no, you um, don't. then all of a sudden you find yourself somewhere else what was it like being on the island? You were on, no, where was it? Pender, Pender Island. Pender Island. Uh, okay. we, so at Check the your maps. At the beginning of the pandemic, we went to Pender Island for a long weekend. And um, while we were there, they announced that schools would be closed, that um, uh, we were going into restrictions, basically lockdown, parks were going to be closed. Mm -hmm. And um, so... I decided to stay, which was kind of insane. I was going to be alone there with two kids. Um, my brother-in-law's cousin, Pete, lived on the island. Friday nights, he'd drop off groceries. And um, so it was, it was insane. But, but we were outside all the time. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was still working for three months. I was working online. I was teaching university online. I was had a kid trying to learn online in grade one <laughs> and I had no support. And when I think that I survived that, I just think that's incredible. Yeah. Um, my very first online university class, the kids did something they'd never done before. They got into an enormous fight. They were both bleeding. I had to stop the class and I thought, this is not going to work. But then I learned to pick better movies. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. And then I could teach online. But yeah. it was, you know, and for everybody it was crazy. Yeah. Um, but we had the benefit of being on the island where um, we, we didn't need to go to a park. We could go to a beach. We could go to a trail. Sure. We could do something. Sure. And, if I, I, and thinking about, I have a lovely little two-bedroom condo. Mm -hmm. But if we had been stuck in here for mm -hmm. that period of time, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Yeah, don't know. yeah. So, no, but the, lots of people yeah. were. Yeah, 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 for sure. I went back to the theater last weekend, first time. Okay, yeah. And um, it was in a little space. What did you see? I'm not going to say. Oh, okay. Because oh. um, okay. I only slacked one. Okay. Um, 
I love people who can go to everything and find some joy in it. Yeah. I, I, I look at people like Joe Lettingham, mm -hmm. who can go to everything and um, have a fresh eye on it. Yeah. And I do not have that. Yeah. So um, I, I was out of there. Yeah. And um, I think there's, like, what are the greatest theater sins? Boring, um, self-indulgent? Like, those have to be two of them. There is a play that I saw once where the, it was a one-hander. I won't mention any names. It was a local, local company and a local actor. And it was a confrontational thing. Uh, as if you were watching a, some, a, a, a rant by Don Rickles, you know, just an mm -hmm. insult, mm -hmm. insult comedy, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Except it wasn't funny. It was serious. Right. And it was like, it was kind of like, I guess, I suppose the message is, was supposed to be get off your ass and do something about all the things you think are wrong. You know, stop being a hypocrite. You know, it was yeah. a challenging kind of thing. But... It was really not fun to be in the audience and be, you know, be dumped on for like an hour. You know, it was, you, you know, that's yeah. I think is one of yeah. the big sins. Yeah. I don't think you have to pander to the audience, but you sure don't have to, you know. Uh, be cruel to be, them. Be nasty, yeah. You know, it doesn't work. I'm all about shaking things up and breaking rules and, and, and you know, th that's my background in theater. And I lo love that when I go somewhere and somebody is really uh, doing it wrong, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But uh, it's tricky. It's tricky. It's a tricky business. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And, <laughs> you know, so, you know. I always yeah. think um, when, <laughs> when Larry was running the Playhouse, he hired Peter Hinton to adapt Michelle Tremblay's Hosanna. Did you see that? I saw Hosanna, uh, I saw Hosanna with Richard Monette at, the, at Colch. the Colch. And I saw it again, I think in Toronto. I don't remember exactly where. So the, we the, did this. Yeah, sorry. So we hired Peter Hinton, yeah. who was a director at the time, who was shaking things up. Yeah. And so Peter decided in the, in, Tremblay's Hosanna, in the English version, all the swearing was in French. Right. Um, and so there was a lot of it. But Peter decided to translate the swearing into English. And um, we were in this rehearsal room. So it was John Moffat, right. the brilliant John Moffat, right, right, playing right, right, Hosanna. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Victor Manis playing Quirette. Right. And um, so it was in the days when you could smoke in the rehearsal hall and we worked in this thick fog of smoke. I didn't smoke, but it was like, and um, so, and we created this gift for the world. Oh my God, we felt that we were doing something extraordinary. Yeah. And we gave our gift to the world and they hated us. <laughs> um, they just hated us. And at intermission at the playhouse, the ushers would open the doors to the lobby and the doors to the outside because otherwise there'd be a bottleneck of people trying to get trying out to of get the building. Out of there. Yeah, right. Whoa. It was really something. Whoa. But it was so, like, we really thought we were giving the world this gift. And I don't know what that says. It's something about um, just the beauty of creating art, um, but not everybody understands what your gift is. There was, we did, Taminus, we did this play. Skull Riders. Did you ever see Skull no, Riders? I wasn't here. Oh well, Skull Riders was. Uh, it was kind of one of the plays I think that killed their company. You know, it was, and I loved it. I was a big proponent. I said, "We got to do Skull Riders. It's hilarious. They'll love. They'll love it." <laughs> no, we played like two people. You know, <laughs> four people. You know, it's really awful. It was a big misjudgment, and I was part of it. My fault. My fault. <laughs> Well, that's you, you the thing, right? You strike out sometimes. You strike out. That's you know? the thing. You know. Um, and so I, when I talk about this production I saw last weekend, I shouldn't be too hard on it because they were trying. And, um, you know, this young man thought he had a story to tell. It was his story, and he was telling it, um, uh, which is, you know, why the theater is there, to yeah. tell stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Glynis Lation used to say it cost a quarter of a million dollars to put a naked man and a bicycle on the Playhouse stage. And that's where you started. 
That's what that cost was. And then you add an actor. And then you add an actor. And so, um, yes, it's yeah. incredibly difficult. When we, um, when we did The Road Forward with Marie Clements, I cannot remember the last time I worked with 17 people on stage. Like, no. it was so exciting. I never learned everybody's name, but, um, <laughs> but it was so fun. And, and you do get so much interaction. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those, it's hard. It's hard. I, um, this morning, I saw that um, Come From Away, which I yes. saw in Seattle, and I loved. My mom was from Newfoundland. Um, uh, had just reopened on uh, the West End, I think, and they'd released a video. Um, yes. You know, like everybody's releasing videos now when they reopen, and it was so exciting. So I was watching that, and oh my God, there were so many people on stage. Yeah. It was yeah. so great. Yeah. Yeah. I loved yeah. that. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I have been a big proponent of that for a long time, long, long time. That, that theater, that theater and film and TV should come together. Because I, I just, I, I just got so tired of doing a whole bunch of work and then, you know, we'd close and nobody'd ever see it again. And, you know, and, yeah. and you'd miss it. You, I, yeah. I wasn't there. You yeah. know, I didn't, I wasn't in town then, you know, and it, you'll never see it. And actors who I love, who you'll never, who are gone. Yeah. No, all, you, all they are are little fainting memories. Some people think that's great. And I, I can understand how you find that, that, that sort of unbearable lightness of, you know, being on stage kind of attractive, but it's not my thing. I'm, a, I'm an archivist and a historian, and that's part of the reason I'm doing this is because I want to preserve, uh, you know, people and their opinions and their experiences. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love that. So. And I, I, I love that too. Like I think um, the people that we have worked with who are no longer here, like I, I talked about the swath of artists lost during AIDS. Brian Torpe. Brian Torpe, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, John Ormerod. Um, yeah. Like just so many artists lost. Um, and that was now almost two generations ago. So, um, you know, they. Ha I guess the question for me is, I. I do want there to be some record of that. Mm -hmm. um, but in twenty years from now, is anybody actually ever going to care? I don't know. Well, somebody will care. Some student will want to do a master's thesis on Vancouver theater yeah. in yeah. from nineteen seventy to two thousand. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was thinking about today was, and Susie, I'm sure you were there, but the Women in View Festival. So that right. lasted 10 years. Right. Um, uh, and so many artists' careers were started there. Um, so I still remember the mission statement, creating opportunities for women in the performing arts. Mm -hmm. And it came out of the Fraticelli Report, which was national research on how many women were in positions, positions of leadership in theater in Canada. Yeah, I remember and that. And it was dismal. Yeah. It was something like, I, I'm, don't, I I'm, I'm, can't be quoted, but I'm going to say it was something like 29%. I don't think it was that uh, much. It I might it was, not have I been. I think it was way less than that, yeah. And I yeah. was stage managing for 10 years before I worked with a female director. Yeah. And it was Jackie Maxwell, who I loved. Yeah. But, you know, that was not that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, so the so that festival is gone, um, but I'm still working with people who came out of there, um, like Diane Blunt is um, uh, an artist that I've done a lot of work with in the last few years, and um, she started as one of the tech crew, right? Because um, we only hired women, yeah. and I remember that when I took that job, I told my friend I was going to work at the Women in View Festival, and we only hired women. And they said, oh, it's just going to be one big cat fight. Um, <laughs> it was fantastic. It was a fantastic experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, but that was the perception. Yeah. And, and women could not move up. Yeah. Like that glass ceiling was low. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, it still is, but I mean, it, it really yeah. was low then, that's for sure. But who was there? Joy Coghill had run the Playhouse. That was, yeah. you know, there were very, very few female artists mm -hmm. who had gotten into those positions. Yeah. So it's better. Um, and I know that they redid a version of the Fraticelli Report a few years ago. Um, so it's better, but it's not great. Yeah. So those opportunities are still necessary for um, female artists, for Indigenous artists, for artists of colour. Like yeah, there's, um, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot more work being done today. So we are legions ahead of where we were. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But we're certainly not where yeah. we need to be. Where do you think theatre will go in terms of, say, things like we're, we're, the, the Canadian system is one where it's pretty much universally, you know, a charitable society funded with grants, you know, from all different sources. There's not really a lot of for-profit theatre in this uh, country. Uh, I remember one of the things I was very impressed with when we did a show at Tarragon back, back in the 70s. Ontario, I think, gave capital grants to theater companies. You could buy things. You could pay off a mortgage. You could, uh, you know, uh, repair the building you yeah. were in. But it all comes in waves. Um, like the last two years, there's been a huge focus on emergency funding, pandemic funding. Um, you know, uh, so what will come after that? Yeah. I'm not sure. Are we going to get a universal basic instinct? Um, we can hear okay. the wind chimes, okay. and okay. I just have to say um, that John Moffat gave me those wind chimes. Uh, and he said uh, to me, um, when you hear the bed chimes, think of Larry and I. Well, yeah, there we are. Yeah. And so every time they chime, That's really nice. I think of the boys. I've been thinking about where the theatre is going um, has to do more with um, things like Me Too and mm -hmm. um, anti-bullying initiatives and um, those things I hope are going to have a big impact on what we consider acceptable behaviour in the theatre. Within the theatre, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, because yeah. when I look back a few years ago, um, I never was who ran the theater amongst a variety of other things. Um, but I had heard legions of stories. Yeah. And so he was expelled by Canadian Actors Equity once mm -hmm. the um, anti-bullying work began mm -hmm. um, because of the number of complaints. But he was retired by then. Right. Um, so what was the point of that? Why right. was no action taken yeah. when he was actively in a leadership role? And yeah. um, when I think the people that we admired so much, I didn't work with Robin Phillips. Uh, I knew so many people who regarded him almost as a Sven mm -hmm. And he was held up as this um, incredible artistic leader. Um, and so I, I was rereading about Robin Phillips because I was thinking about the things that I had heard about how he worked. And one of his obituaries actually said he was brutal and a bully. Um, but only one. Every other obituary talked about his incredible artistic leadership, his incredible art form. Um, but he was mm -hmm. a bully mm -hmm. and brutal. And I did work with Derek Golby, who mm -hmm. was whose behavior was appalling. Okay. Now, we're moving into, into territory that will get Susie and I sued. No, I looked it up. I looked it up. Um, you can't slander somebody who's dead. Um, oh, good. You should Are these probably people take, all dead? You better take the out. Um, <laughs> well, as long as we're talking factual information. You know. but, um, but that's the thing that is exciting for me, is that I hope that we don't tolerate that behavior anymore. There yeah. used to be yeah. a perspective that an artist could do anything he wanted in terms of behavior. 
And certainly I worked with people like that. Yeah, there was sure. a hole punched in the wall of the Playhouse Rehearsal Hall by an artist who shall remain nameless. Um, but um, who was so angry it was scary to work with him. Yeah. I worked with an actor in Toronto and other actors would hide behind the scenery when he was backstage. They were so afraid of him. But so the thing that I feel now, we don't tolerate that anymore. And no. I think that's fantastic. It's a fine line between a place where it's safe for all the oddballs to coalesce <laughs> and do their thing and, and a place for all the people who are so tormented, you know, that they feel like they, you know, can punch yeah. a hole through the wall or, you know, scream yeah. their vitriol at their co-worker. You know? Yeah. So it, it yeah, yeah. It, times are changing. No, I think, um, I, I, I actually think you catch more flies with honey. Yeah, yeah, me too. And um, I only once in my entire career yelled at anyone. Yeah. And um, it was never somewhere I needed to go. Yeah. Of course, now that I have two kids, I'm yelling all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But... Um, they seem like such lovely kids. I've seen them photobomb you on Zoom oh, things yes. when we got yes. we got together for a mental health Zoom call. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really yes. sweet. And and you know, they're just such they're two lovely kids. They I mean, are. You know, they're, they're adorable yeah, yeah. and delightful and um and children. Yeah, yeah, they're children, um, yeah. Uh yeah. but it is, you know, they're like, lucky to be with you. And they are I'm lucky yeah, to have yeah, them. I yeah. mean it really is um, you know, you never know where love is going to come from, and sometimes uh, it just happens. Yeah. These are complicated times to yeah. look at that stuff. Like, I, I, I don't know how we deal with some of that stuff. What do we do? Um, do we just discard? I think you listen. I think it begins with listening a whole lot, you know, and for, and for people who, it, it, you know, you think you've listened, you know, you think you, you're woke, you, you know, but, but there's a lot of listening that has to be done. And then for the people that are talking, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of people trying to listen out there. There's a whole yeah. lot of people who are yeah. trying to listen. And, and there's a lot of allies, maybe, that people don't realize that they're allies, you know. And uh, a lot of hearts that are in the right place. And I see yeah. it in friends, my friends, yeah. like you guys, and I won't name other friends, but, um, you know, old white guys who mm -hmm. are really trying now. Mm -hmm. They're trying to listen. They're trying to figure mm -hmm. out, you know, the world is changing. Um, what do I need to learn? And yeah. And so... It's, I'm proud to see that happening. Yeah, yeah, it's really heartening. And I mean, I'm Jimmy Carter, ex-president Jimmy Carter, has uh, talked a lot about being a, a, a white man in the South in a period when, when segregation was just the assumed way of life and how hard it was to kind of d d dig your head out of that, you know, because that's all you'd learn. Yeah. I mean, that's all I'd learned when I was a kid, you know, and, you know, so, yeah, it's, 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 you have to, you have to be, you have to do the work. Yeah. You can't not do the work, so. No, you have to do the work, and it's, like, I, because I'm part of this Indigenous family, I, um, a, a member of the family wrote on Facebook, um, how, what did she write? How welcome she felt at Walmart, because... Someone escorted her all around the store, asked her every five minutes if she wanted something. Um, <laughs> she I was help never you? alone. You sure I can help you? And she was being facetious, but um, but that's how it is, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that's not an experience I've ever had. Mm -mm. Well, I definitely thought I'd be traveling at this point in my life, but, you know, yeah. nobody is. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, so I hope to be able to do that. I hope, um, you know, I hope to be able to take the kids places. They, sure. um, they love chocolate croissants. I think we should go to France. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a good enough reason. Yeah. 
yeah. Um, uh, that's, I want to take them, um, uh, I don't know if I could bear right now to take a five and an eight year old on a road trip, but when they're a bit older, um, they're, they're from the Quakatoos Reserve in northern Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, so it would be fantastic to be able to take them there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to be able to do that one day. Um, but definitely, we I couldn't think be worse than the actors <laughs> than driving a van with the actors. Oh, it could, it could. <laughs> um, it, in particular, the repetition of ch children's CDs. Um, it, oh it, it, yeah, it right, be, right, yes. right. Yeah, um, Wait, it's worse let's than play that again. Yeah. It's worse than hungover actors for oh, sure. Oh yeah, really. Um, <laughs> but um, I didn't, and also I, there are some artists whose work I'd like to support. Like mm -hmm. if I I can, I'd love to work with Renee Morriso again. I just mm -hmm. love her work. I'm hoping that, um, you know, small things will come up. I don't want a full-time job, um, but I'm hoping that I ha still have the opportunity to be engaged in um, some way yeah. in, in the art form going well, forward. You, you should, I mean, if you want to, you should be. I mean, people, there, so, there's people who don't know you, but there's people that do know you and know how good you are you know all well, these things so you know that was the funny thing about going to the theater last week i walked into the theater theater and three different people said hi don and i thought oh uh, this used to be my life like it yeah. was so extraordinary yeah. after almost two years of not being in a theater to remember that i was uh, part of that